uh, for that lovely introduction. Um, good evening, everyone, and thanks for tuning in for this presentation on the evolution of the Oxford sinkhole. Uh, this evening, I'll provide you with some background on this now famous sinkhole in Oxford, and then we'll have a closer look at how it fits in the framework of the regional geology of the area. The town of Oxford is located in northern Nova Scotia, just off the Trans-Canada Highway 104. Main Street is the artery that connects the town and emergency services to the Trans-Canada. And the Lions Parkland occupies a small peninsula in Salt Lake along Main Street, where the sinkhole formed in 2018, about 15 meters away from the Lions Community Centre. A small depression was first noticed near the western end of the parking lot in the park in late July 2018 and was described as approximately one meter in diameter and about 60 centimeters deep. The Lions Club monitored the depression and on August the 10th backfilled the hole with a load of shale and just 10 days later on August 20th there was a sudden collapse just steps away from users of the park. The resultant hole was over 10 meters deep with fast flowing water at the bottom. This aerial image from 2015 shows the approximate initial location of the sinkhole at the western end of the parking lot in between several large spruce trees. And the initial depression is shown on the left and the photo on the right shows some subsidence after the small hole was backfilled with shale in early August. These next few slides will show the progression of the sinkhole over several days and weeks from the initial sudden collapse onwards. These photos and videos were captured by Mark Rustin, who was a witness in the park at the time of the initial collapse on August 20th and emergency services were deployed to the scene and the public was asked to vacate the park for safety reasons. The initial sinkhole grew very rapidly. These photos were taken one day apart and the hole had more than doubled in size. The rushing water can be seen at the bottom of the hole as well as water percolating from the side walls inward. Here we can see one of several large spruce trees falling into the hole and soon to be followed by the picnic table behind it. And the top of some trees remain visible in the sinkhole, but many of these trees were seemingly flushed down the sinkhole and never to be seen again. By August 24th, the majority of the large trees surrounding the initial hole have fallen into the sinkhole and cracks were beginning to form in the ground up to 20 meters away from the active margin of the sinkhole. You can see that the spray paint on the ground. Cracks can be seen extending outward from the sinkhole margins, both transversely and radially. The overall direction of growth of the sinkhole was to the northeast toward the community garden and playground area. August 25th, so five days since the initial collapse, more radial cracks continued to develop in the direction of the growth of the sinkhole. And keep your eyes on the corner of the sinkhole where drone footage captured a large section of the ground collapsing into the hole. And another video from the following day, that's about a two meter vertical drop along the bank of the sinkhole to the water. There wouldn't be much of a chance of escape if someone fell in. Uh, there were life jackets and rescue throw bags kept on hand at all times and security guards were put in place to keep the curious on the hearse at a safe distance.
You'll see more markings on the ground as we attempted to use the cracks to estimate how big the hole was going to grow and in what direction. The problem was once a crack was identified, the hole was growing so rapidly it was often too dangerous or completely gone by the time it could be measured again. So use this one as an example. And the next day it's at the edge of the hole. So the sinkhole was still growing several meters per day a week after the initial sudden collapse. The following day, the margins of the sinkhole are at the edge of the pavement in the parking lot. And the day after that, it's taking away part of the parking lot. And I just want to draw your attention to the picnic table structure in the, the top left corner of the photo. On the far side of the concrete slab at the picnic table shelter, we saw what looked like separation of the slab from the sod, which made it look like the concrete slab was moving towards the sinkhole. So at the time, the ground was moving over 25 meters away from the margins of the sinkhole, even though we didn't see any discernible cracks in that area at that time. These are all the survey points gathered across the park to monitor for signs of change in the ground surface. At this time, cracks in the ground were opening up far from the margins of the sinkhole, which is represented by the yellow stars. And the emergency management office was tracking these changes closely should there become a need to evacuate the area along that section of Main Street. We can see from the surveys that the overall growth pattern in the sinkhole was to the northeast away from the community center. And here's an example of crack expansion. So crack 12 began as a hairline fracture over 20 meters from the edge of the active sinkhole. And day by day, this crack pr propagated. Each day is marked by a different color of paint. One month after the sinkhole began, the crack in the parking lot was nearly 40 millimeters wide. And let's fast forward a bit and look at how the sinkhole looks now. It looks like things have begun to stabilize and part of crack 12 has managed to hang on over on the left side of the photo by the red arrow. Some vegetation is growing, some ducks are visiting the pond, and the water is less turbid. The trees you see in the center likely help form a plug in the bottom of the hole, and the sinkhole hasn't grown much since its rapid onset in autumn of 2018. We do expect some further expansion as the steep sidewalls continue to slump and stabilize. But I bet you have some questions like, how deep is the sinkhole? Why did it form? Will it keep growing? Will another one form? These are all good questions. Investigation of the sinkhole does pose some challenges. First, there's very little background information available to use as a reference. For example, there's a lack of well logs with geological information and water chemistry in the area. These things would be useful for better understanding the depth to and composition of the bedrock or how much dissolved mineral is in the water. Thick overburden from glacial deposits also masks the bedrock geology in this area. We weren't able to see what the rock type is that caused the sinkhole, but we are assuming it is salt, gypsum, and hydrate or limestone because those rocks have the potential to dissolve in water, unlike the sandstone or conglomerate that is known to occur elsewhere in the area. When the initial collapse occurred, only sand and soil was visible in the profile of the sinkhole. So we know that there is at least 10 meters of overburden above a bedrock surface. In the water conductance, simple geophysical methods like ground penetrating radar or GPR are highly useful in some applications. However, at the Oxford sinkhole, this technology was ineffective due to the high conductivity of the soils and the groundwater in the area. So a test run at GPR was only able to see one or two meters beneath the surface. And we know that the sinkhole is at least 10 meters below surface, gauging from the size of the initial collapsed hole. An interesting note about the conductivity in the area. So at the time of the sinkhole formation, the conductivity was around 3,500 to 4,000 micro siemens per centimeter and compare that to freshwater and nearby river Phillip around 
50 microsiemens per centimeter and ocean water around 35,000. So the water in the lake and the sinkhole was more brackish than fresh, which makes sense why they call it Salt Lake. And since 2018, the water conductivity in the lake has been increasing and now maxes out my meter at around 20,000 microsiemens per centimeter. And so the lake is now five times more conductive than it was when the sinkhole initially formed. And this increase in conductivity is likely due to increased dissolution of salt at depth that is coming to surface through springs that feed the lake. So let's consider the sinkhole in the regional geological context now. Part of the Oxford area is underlain by rocks of the Windsor Group, which is an ancient evaporated sea represented by the blue color on this geological map. You can see several other areas in Nova Scotia are also underlain by this formation, and common rock types in these areas include gypsum salt and hydrate and limestone, all of which are variably soluble in water. Zooming in a little closer, the geological map describes an area of extensive karsts and sinkholes and gypsum outcrop. With the Oxford sinkhole located near the boundary of the Windsor Group, with the Oxford Fault. North of the fault is the Ragged Reef Formation, which is predominantly composed of sandstone and conglomerate. And south of the fault is a wedge of the Windsor Group. So what does karst mean? Karst describes a landscape that is prone to dissolution of the underlying bedrock, resulting in a sinkhole prone terrain. Sinkholes, caves, conduits, springs, disappearing streams, and solution piping are all common features of karst topography. Some sinkholes can form ponds and some can coalesce into larger lake systems. So how does a sinkhole form? When water interacts with soluble bedrock, like that in the Windsor Group, void spaces can open up in the subsurface. When the roof of the void can no longer hold up above that cavity, it collapses the surface, resulting in a sinkhole. So water plays an important role in the formation of sinkholes and karst terrain. Changes to the natural hydrological balance can contribute to the formation of sinkholes, whether it's from surface water, runoff, precipitation, or changes in the subterranean groundwater system. For example, diverting water through ditches or downspouts into karst prone areas can focus the amount of dissolution of the bedrock in that area, leading to an increased risk for sinkhole development. High rainfall events and drought can also destabilize an area, leading to an increased potential for sinkhole formation. Artificial sinkholes can form when flowing water like that from broken water and sewer lines flush away sediment, resulting in the collapse of the overlying material. And this type of sinkhole is most common in urban environments. However, not all sinkholes are created equally. Dissolution sinkholes form through active contact with surface water and precipitation that slowly erodes the bedrock surface, resulting in depressions often ponded with water. Cover subsidence sinkholes also form slowly over time when surficial material trickles down through cracks and fissures in the bedrock created by dissolution. Some sinkholes can also appear in an instant with catastrophic results. This type of sinkhole is referred to as cover collapse and is the result of failure of either the overlying sediments or bedrock roof over a large opening in the subsurface. This bottom-up style of sinkhole is the most dangerous and unpredictable type to form. In all types of sinkholes though, the geological processes that trigger them are a continuous process. Old sinkholes can become reactivated and new ones can form. So if you are in an identified karst risk zone, it's always wise to watch your step. Okay, back to the Oxford sinkhole. <clears throat> How deep is it? I wouldn't consider it safe to dive down and investigate the depth of the sinkhole, but this 